All right. Welcome back, team. This is 2024, and we are back with our Real Estate Roundtable with the wonderful Steve Soretsky out in Vancouver. Hi, Steve. Always a pleasure. Looking forward to uh, another big year. And the equally wonderful and marvelously sweater-clad John out here <laughs> in Toronto. Hello again. Making, making us all look bad. <laughs> he is rocking a sweater like nobody's business today this is uh we're in roll neck uh season uh in toronto in january so actually more than that it is a snowstorm here first snowstorm yeah. everything is covered in snow here for the first it time is. in the year so appropriate and uh yeah so let's push on i hope everyone was rested from their holidays Steve, Steve looks like he was busy. He kept pumping out content uh, over the holidays, making us look bad over here at Moose Smartly. I don't know how you... <laughs> it never, never ends, man. Um, <laughs> let's just hope it translates into some more real estate deals here this year. <laughs> yeah, so yes, hi. we're glad to be back. We took a, a good long break and uh, hope to be... Uh, we're now inspired with new topics and uh, yeah, things to look out for in the new year. But before we go on to the new year... I wanted to ask you both about how the year ended for your real estate markets in Toronto and Vancouver in terms of the stats and uh, and your opinions on that. Uh, who wants to start? John. John. Sure. <laughs> uh, so 2023 was terrible. I mean, when we started, if we look back, I mean, if you go back to, you know, just over a year ago, I think most people were expecting 2023 to not be a great market, um, you know, but it was kind of a weird market because the market actually accelerated in the first half of the year, um, you know, partly because rates dropped a little bit, the Bank of Canada paused, but it was really the second half where the market got crushed, you know, like people fell off a cliff in terms of demand. Uh, and when we look at the sales volume, the number of homes sold in 2023 uh, was the lowest since 2000, which is how far back the data went. You know, uh, so it's quite it's quite the it's quite the trend to see that big of a decline uh, in, in sales volumes in 23 years or so. Um, you know, we saw, of course, some softening in prices. Uh, if we look at sort of aggregate stats, like a 2023 versus 2022, sort of the entire year we're down largely single digits, you know, city of Toronto did a li little bit better in the suburbs down about 3% suburbs are down like six to 8% uh, for houses, you know, single digit declines in the suburbs, but rents were all up everywhere. Um, you know, average rents for low rise homes, uh, you know, were uh, the highest was Toronto actually on 11% single digits in the suburbs. Uh, and then condos are up close to eight to 9% in a single year. So, you know, that's kind of like an interesting dynamic where you're getting, you know, prices falling in the in the housing market because people are hitting pause. But, you know, people who need to move, if they're hitting pause, they need to move somewhere and they usually end up renting. Um, and, and this has contributed to the increase in rents. Um, so it ended up a pretty rough year, especially like the last half, sluggish sales, sluggish interest, very few showings, uh, very slow market to kind of end 2023. And Steve, what was the story? Uh, how did Vancouver end the year? Yeah, it's funny. I was looking at your 23-year low uh, in sales there in the GTA, and I'm just kind of looking at Vancouver. And, you know, it was a slow year. I think we were 20% below the 20-year average, right? So we've got like a long history of, of, of sales for the year. So it was a weak year, but I think it was like, you know, fifth worst year over the last two decades. So like it was bad, but it wasn't like, oh, wow, 23 year low. Um, but, you know, I think like the big challenge, of course, in 2023 was the gap between, you know, buyers expectations and sellers expectations. That gap was just really hard to close, right? I mean, obviously buyers contending with higher, higher rates, uh, trying to get sellers to sort of come down to sort of adjust for that. But I think at the end of the day, we just saw, you know, we still kind of plagued by a pretty low inventory in Vancouver in the grand scheme of things. If you really zoom out, um, inventory remains pretty tight. And so it's just hard to get sellers really down the prices. I mean, the crazy thing is if you look at, you know, the benchmark price across greater Vancouver, it finished the year up 5%. Um, I mean, John, that certainly wasn't like that's my, 
base case coming into 2023, right? I mean, if you think about 2022, I mean, that was a tough year. Prices were coming down, the, you know, especially the back half of 22. That was, you know, like naturally one would have concluded that, okay, you know, 2022 was tough. Inventory is probably going to keep piling up. Um, mortgage rates actually went even higher in 2023. And the fact that prices went up 5% is is pretty crazy. And I think like, I think it's just a subtle reminder that this market can humble a lot of forecasters, right? I mean, not just myself, but, you know, all the uh, the doomsday people on Twitter or the economists at the big banks. I don't think a lot of people really saw that coming. And, and so, you know, moving into 2024, I think it's going to be interesting. I mean, I'm going to be honest, I don't have a ton of conviction this year, um, but I'm sure we'll kind of get into that. And uh my memory, if it's right, was that that bump up in March of 2023, because of that bank failure out in the US and a couple, I think one big Silicon Valley bank uh, led to this rush into bonds, which saw a bit of a drop for, for interest rates for a split second. Did you guys see, like, especially in Toronto and, and maybe Vancouver, if there was price protection, if you want to call it that, for home prices, was that run-up that happened a little bit there enough to then protect what against what was then a drop-off consistently to the end of the year? I mean, I think in Toronto, we're back to where we were. So basically, whatever gains we got in the first half of 2023 – disappeared in the second half of 2023 right. right so we did see an acceleration and you're right i think it was a combination of declining longer term fixed rates because of the collapse of silicon valley bank but also the sentiment from the bank of canada you know they signaled a pause and the mood was they're done hiking you know at least that was the mood at the beginning of january you know among some people among the public it's kind of the signal that people got right uh, obviously that was incorrect but it did spur you know the the sentiment and kind of the optimism and you got to keep in mind at least in toronto i can't speak for vancouver up say like january 2023 a year ago from now buyers had moved to the sidelines in 2022 because they saw prices fall in the first half and they were kind of waiting on the sidelines for prices to fall further right and in the second half of 2022, prices were flat. Like they didn't go anywhere. It was just like a sticky market. Like it wasn't a bull market. It wasn't a bear. It was just like boring, flat prices. So by the time January 2023 came and the Bank of Canada signaled, well, maybe we're done hiking, you know, a lot of buyers, and we just saw this with our clients, they're like, okay, I'm done waiting. Let's just buy a home now. And, you know, let's just jump into the market. And that was the sentiment at that time. And certainly, the, the decline in fixed rates helped that and prices actually accelerated. It was just like mind blowing that we actually saw an increase in prices in the first half of 20. And to Steve's point, I don't think anyone predicted that. Like I was very pessimistic or more pessimistic in 2022. I did not see that coming. No one did. And, and he's right. It's the market humbles you because it's, these things are hard to predict. I think, uh, like sorry to interrupt you, just John, to your point there. I think that's just like, something that I've really come to like appreciate was like, I've, I've become like more of like a sentiment person now mm -hmm. uh, because I just think like the housing, especially the housing market, right? Like the reality is, is like everyone that's watching these videos, like, well, like a lot of my clients, like, like come work with us. Like they come through like, you know, the YouTube channel or the podcast and they tend to be like finance oriented, you know, watching the macro economy and trying to figure out the sort of the next move. The reality is, is like, well, that, is how you know a lot of my clients might operate the general market is 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 in my opinion is not that sophisticated it's just they don't they don't they're not looking at global market they're not looking at what's happening with us banks they're just looking saying mortgage rates went from five and a half to 4.7 my mortgage payment is now more affordable i now i'm ready to buy like mm -hmm. it's just all sentiment based right it's and and so i think that's really what you have to watch it's just like when is the, the sentiment because these animal spirits in in the housing market um most home buyers out there don't live in like a spreadsheet mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and so this is why i think like markets like housing are sometimes hard to predict you can look at you know the mortgage renewal wall and you can look at 
you know, what should be a wave of, you know, foreclosure. But like, again, that's just not how most people tend to think. It's, it's anyway. So I think that's an important sort of asterisk for people to kind of keep in mind as we move forward here. And like, because I, I think like, I see a lot of it in the, you know, whatever YouTube comments, Twitter, people talking about the market and like, everyone's like, oh, you know, these realtors are putting out like that rates are going to fall and they're creating this FOMO. And it's like, yeah, maybe, but like that, it's just like, that's just like the simplistic way of the market. Yeah. Like it is like how people think it's like rates down, housing activity picks up and people want to buy when, when things suck and everybody says, don't buy. It's a bad market. Yeah. I, I agree with you. I mean, a lot of the, the the ups and downs we've seen, especially the past three, four years, um, a, a lot of it was sentiment. You know what I mean? Like, and obviously, you know, rates and all of that make a difference. But like, in many cases, like the responses are disproportionate to the economics. You know what I mean? Totally. Uh, and, and there's a ton of, you know, behavioral factors, animal spirits, all of that stuff. And I agree with you. And that's why it's like impossible to predict. Because what, what you hear a lot, right, is like, okay, rates are going to come down this year. Like, that's the general consensus among, you know, mm -hmm. the market and, and economists, right? So rates are going to come down. You're seeing that in the bond market and and interest rate expectations. Um, and one of the reasons for that is, like, well, the economy is going to weaken and there's going to be some job losses and 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 probably a recession. But, like, again, the average home buyer isn't thinking, well, rates are down because there's a recession, so I should wait. Yeah, it's, that's true. People, that's true. People just go rates down more Let's buy a house. I buy true. a house. Yeah. You know, they're not worried about like, okay, maybe I'll lose my job in nine months. You yeah. Know, that's not how people think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, famously, I think one of the only uh Nobel Prizes in economics awarding in the housing arena went to Case and Schiller for their observation that housing is uh, a realm of economics that is very influenced by sentiment. So yeah. It's even in the data. Well, yeah, <laughs> even well, the data sure. shows that sentiments matter in real estate. But it's like, and, you know, it's like, why does everybody think about it? It's like, I mean, as much as we, like, I try to educate our clients all the time, right? And like, we, you know, I do my best. But at the end of the day, it's like, the reality is, is to be honest, like most of them don't really listen. Um, it's like, why does everybody end up always buying at the peak, right? Like everybody mm -hmm. starts tripping over themselves as soon as houses start going into multiple offers everybody's like uh oh and they and so they just start seeing price gains and people start talking about it at holiday parties and and summer barbecues about you know how much the housing market's going up and people start panicking and they all sort of buy in at the same time and, and you I'm just gonna... said something nobel prize worthy because <laughs> that's exactly what so the, Kate's and Schiller said, right? So, so the, the funny thing about the Nobel Prize, just to digress, I mean, and, and this is like the funny part about economics, right? That year, the, I, think, I don't think it was two or three, but for sure two of the people who won it was Robert Schiller, who is very much into, you know, housing bubbles, sentiments, uh, all of these factors, right? Uh, and the other person was Eugene Fama, who basically thinks all of those ideas are nonsense, there are no such thing as housing bubbles. The whole market is rational, right? Um, so it's kind of funny how you have these very strong opposing views kind of winning Nobel Prize at the same time because, you know, people have different conflicting views on what fuels housing market and asset prices and all of these things. So anyways. That's Robert Schiller's point. book is good, by the way. I've read that. I can't remember. What is it? Is it called? What is it called? Animal Spirits? He has one called Animal Spirits. He has one called Irrational Exuberance. He has another one called, uh, I forget what it's called, a more recent one called, uh, anyways, it's, it's again, I've read the, the two. Yes, several, read. yeah. Both good books, yeah. yeah. And uh, he and that thing that you described, um, uh, Steve, as the people at dinner parties, he called that the um, gambler's excitement. He yeah. actually coined exactly that feeling. Your friends, I see, he said gambler's excitement. I take exception to that a little bit because I think it's more about fear of being left out and, yeah. and being right. left behind, mm -hmm. which is a different type of anxiety that we see in the housing market. And I know that myself, like I'm on the sidelines looking for the right time to jump in. And I said to you both at the end of 2022, I don't know, guys, I feel like the minute a single thing happens that's exciting, everyone's going to rush in. And then after that banks collapsed, you know, everyone rushed in. Fine, prices then fell after that little run up. But the problem is a new peak keeps getting set. Mm -hmm. And those tend to be sticky. 
Because mm-hmm. as we know, also from the research, sellers then are very stubborn mm-hmm. and they cling to those that new price height. Exactly. So even the little run-ups in prices, in my observation in housing, they're not the same as like a quick run-up in stocks. They're, it's mm-hmm. just not that, you know, yeah. it's not like it'll go back down to some rational mark again. Yeah, it's Well, it's quick on the way up and it's very sticky on the way down for housing. Yeah, for like, sure. Yeah, people emotionally anchored to a price. And I mean, you know, to get back to the Vancouver market, I mean, that's what we've seen a ton of, right? Is like, um, why were housing still so low? Well, sellers listed the price. They didn't get the price. So they just took it off the market. And they're like, oh, we'll try again next year. And again, whether or not that ends up being the right strategy, we'll, we'll find out. But um I'm, and it, and this goes back to kind of the whole thing about why a lot of real estate's behavioral. I mean, that's really rooted in a lot of these academic theories. I mean, Daniel Kahneman wrote about this, where you know, when when you look at real estate transactions, when a seller's selling, uh, if they're selling at a price just after a decline in prices, they don't they don't measure. Uh, th- their return on their investment from when they bought it. You know, they would have been up if they bought it 20 years ago. Their return is actually anchored against the highest price a year ago, right? So your returns are a function of where home prices are. And if they've been trending up, you look at your gain from when you originally bought it to when you're selling. But if prices have dipped in the past year or two, your return is actually, they measure it based on what I could have gotten if I had sold at the peak. And that is really why sellers are stubborn. Um, it's largely that is the biggest factor. Do you, know many, do you know how many conversations I've had over the last like two years on that exact topic, which is like, <laughs> hey, I could have got this in February of 2022. And yeah. now I'm getting like 100 grand less. And I'm like, but you're still up 500 grand over the last three years. Yeah. <laughs> Tax free. But like nobody rationalizes no. that. Hundred percent, and we see it every day. Like exactly that conversation. Anyways, it's so funny. I wonder if it's more of a, a different feeling. It's like the jeal- is there the jealousy of your neighbor who you're heuristic to use Kahneman's words. Yeah, <laughs> when you find out your peak. buddy made more than you, yeah, because they just, sold at the peak. And it, it scorches always, people. Everybody <laughs> always thinks that their house is the best house. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, all right. So uh, what would you guys tell me now then? Because we're back sort of in the same uh, place a year later. What should someone like me expect for the year ahead? If um, I'm potentially a buyer in the year ahead, maybe I'm a seller. What might happen? John? Oh. <laughs> um, I, I got to be honest, I'm not as as bearish as I was last year. Uh, and, and not that I think the market's going to be amazing, but we got to remember, we're coming off of like one of the worst years in terms of sales, at least in like 23 years in Toronto, right? So my instinct is sales are going to go up from here. Like I, I can't imagine we're going to go lower, right? Um, where are prices going? I mean, it's very hard to say. I, I think I tweeted the other day, like, you know, again, I think the biggest risk to to prices is if inflation stays sticky and rates stay high. You know, to Steve's point, I think this, the the markets now are expecting the opposite. Like rates are not going to stay sticky and, and sorry, inflation is not going to be sticky and rates are going to go down. And if rates are going to decline, that's going to be probably a, a, obviously a positive stimulus on housing. I don't know if prices are going to go up or stay flat. I think it's less likely that they'll decline in that environment. And again, you know, the flip side is, and I did a poll on Twitter asking for people's advice because most people are bearish. I go, why do you why are you bearish? Because and their their general argument was, and the most common answers were concerns about a recession and job losses uh, and over leveraged households and investors. Like that is why prices are going to fall. And those are of course risks. I think those risks become material if we have a deep recession. Like if we have like a mild recession. Uh, I don't think we're going to see like a, a big decline in prices. Um, and similarly, yeah, I mean, some over leveraged investors are going to have to sell. The question is, is it going to be so many that it floods the market with inventory? And my instinct is no, I don't necessarily think that's the case. Like, I think we'll see more of them, but maybe the market could use more of them. And that might keep, it's more likely to keep the market balanced rather than crashing is my instinct. But again, this is, 
I mean, January, if, if things change in three months, who knows? But that's my instinct for, for the year ahead. Yeah, no, it's a, I think that, um, yeah, I don't, I'm, like I said at the beginning of the show, I don't have a very strong conviction. Um, I think that, I think it's, I think it's right that, you know, rates are coming down. I think that, you know, people might not want to agree or believe, or maybe people don't think that's the right thing that Bank of Canada should be doing, but I think rates are going to get cut this year. My only hesitation is like, does inflation come back? Yeah, I agree with you. It, like, And does it come back in like Q2, Q3, maybe it's Q4, maybe it's, you know, that, that's my only concern. I think like, but I do wonder like, so like the Bank of Canada can cut rates. Let's say they cut rates as the market expects. The market's pricing 100, 100 basis points of cut. So let's just say that happens. I'm I, I'm not, I'm like a little bit hesitant to say, is the bond market going to play ball? Because at the mm -hmm. end of the day, it's like the bond market sets your fixed rate mortgages. And so, mm -hmm. so long as the Canadian government and obviously the UI, all these governments around the world continue to sort of um, run massive deficit spending, like maybe the bond market just doesn't play ball. And so like maybe your mortgage rates, you know, I got clients picking up three-year rates today at about 5.2. Maybe it comes down to the high fours. Like I'm not convinced the high fours, I think it gets the market moving. You get more volume, more mm -hmm. sales, but I'm not necessarily convinced like at, you know, 4.8% mortgage, I'm not convinced you've got a bull market. No, um, yeah, no, I don't think so. I agree with you. You know, so yeah, you, you know, you get like these little like ups and downs, but in mm -hmm. the in the general grand scheme of things, like if rates kind of level out here somewhere in the fours, I still think there's, I still think it's going to be sort of a flattish market, you know, and maybe it's flattish for several years, right? Like I think yeah. that there's going to be people that, that are on the spectrum that are just not able to, um, you know, renew or refinance and then they have to sell or, you know, and, and John, do you like, I think the one thing that I'm looking at and saying, okay, if mortgage rates, let's say they come down and this spring, this summer, they're at four and a half percent. Right. Which is, you know, grand scheme of things, not horrible. We were at six, almost six and a half at the end of this year. So you're at four and a half. I'm not convinced that when I, mean, I pencil the numbers, I mean, I don't see how an investor makes money at four and a half percent mortgage rates. Mm -hmm. So like, I'm still not convinced you're going to get all these investors back into the market. So you're not, I agree with you. And I mean, and to be clear, I'm not bullish this year. I, I'm just not convinced the market's going to tank. Like I think flat-ish yeah. is probably the most likely outcome. Um, I agree if you investors aren't coming back. I mean, I don't, I don't see that. Like, especially like condo investors, you're right at four and a half percent. It just still doesn't make sense. Um, but again, I think even like if we think about investors already own, uh, many of them are probably going to hold on because a lot of those investors are not at, uh, you know, 80% LTVs, right? Yeah. If you're at, you know, they bought 10 years ago, about whatever. So if you're 60% mortgage debt on, you can make it work at four and a half percent. You know what I mean? Like you're not making a lot of money or losing some money, but we've seen investors are fine losing yeah. 500 bucks a month on their cash flow. Yeah, right? exactly. It just, be, it just becomes like a less attractive investment. Yeah. Where like where you can just put your money somewhere else. And so I just look at it and say like, you know, here in BC, um, you know, we've had these very strict rent controls over the last couple of years under this provincial government. And so like, you know, for 2024, I said, okay, you know, we're supposed to raise it with inflation, but we're going to again, we're going to cap it again. And we're going to cap it at three and a half percent. So you can raise your rent three and a half percent. But it's like, again, if you're renewing your mortgage instead of 2.4, it's 4.4. And, you know, your strata fees keep going up um, a lot more than three and a half percent. Your insurance keep going up. Your property taxes are going up, I think, seven and a half percent. So it's like, I just think the investors continue to kind of get like squeezed where I'm just like, it's just becoming a much more challenging mm -hmm. sell that uh, as an investor, I, I just think like the glory days of the last 10 years, I don't know if, if those are going to be replicated anytime soon. Yeah, I agree. So just before we move off this topic quickly, if we're looking at historic low levels of sales in 2023, um, are you thinking, you know, kind of the same kind of volumes, very low uh, because, yeah. and it was it investor activity that, all these years for the last 10 years has made that marginal, you know, has 
has, uh, is it that investor activity coming out or is it also coupled with buyers being really afraid and on the sidelines and maybe unable to move as well? Yeah, both. I, I'd say like the low sales this year was a combination of both. Um, arguably probably more end users pulling out, you know what I mean? Like obviously a lot of investors pulled out, but even end users can't, couldn't afford it. If you're paying like 6.6 .6 or whatever it is on your mortgage, getting stress tested at 8.6, you know, the numbers don't work. It's very hard to get in. It's pretty uh, hard to qualify for a larger mortgage. And then yeah, carry that yeah it's impossible. So and I, prices and I, a, had gone up again. So it's like, you're not even, it's, a, you know, what can you get? Yeah. And so I, I think like sales will be higher, but I agree with you. I don't think it's going to be a, a bull year. I don't think it's going to be busy. I think we'll probably maybe be a bit higher than 2022, which was also a terrible year. You know what I mean? Um, but it's going to be sluggish. It's like, but probably a little better than 2023, but not, I don't think it's going to be very busy. To Steve's point, investors are probably not going to come back. And like the buyers who are going to come back, it's going to be like, you know, a slight increase. It's not going to see, you're not going to see this rush of buyers. I don't think uh, hitting the market. We've, um, yeah, I think to, to that point, it's funny because like, I feel like I heard more and more stories, um, not so much with like our clients, you know, just chat with people in the industry. It's like, oh, you know, why are they selling? And, you know, it was like people that had like too much house, which was mm -hmm. like the mortgage is coming up for renewal or they're on a variable rate mortgage and they just they're like, this house is too much. Like it's, it's it's too big. Like, you know, maybe instead of a five bedroom house, we can downsize to like a three bedroom townhouse or a four bedroom house and, and, you know, take some money off the table and lower our payments because like this was, this, this mortgage payment was digestible when it was 2.2 .2 and at 5.3, like it, I, we're not comfortable. Mm -hmm. So just seeing quite a few more of those, which is like, you know, was never anything that was on the radar, you know, two, three, four, five years ago. Mm -hmm. so almost pushing ahead, downsizing uh, decisions. Deleveraging. Kind of thing. Yeah, deleveraging. Deleveraging. Or yeah. if you were waiting to downsize, maybe you're not pushing yeah. into it faster, right? Um, yeah. I mean, you yeah. see that in like the, it's funny enough, you see that in like the mortgage credit data, right? I mean, what mortgage, residential mortgage credit growth is at the lowest levels since the 1980s, right? I mean, so it's like people are clearly just not taking on mm -hmm a lot of new mortgage debt um given where rates are at and and so and and this is i think partly why i, I where i'm you know mixed on the whole distressed seller tank in the market thing is because there are 100 percent going to be some on the margins but the reality is most households they've made money on their real estate right like this household even if say they're distressed because they can't afford the mortgage at their current payments they have equity in their home, they're selling and they're downsizing, right? Uh, and even if they had an investment property and if they've owned it for years, they've made money on that. Like it's it's not like uh, everyone's underwater. Like the distress probably in the GTA at least is more in the pre-construction because those yeah. closings are coming up. They're worth less than what people bought them for. Um, you know, so there's definitely more distress there. Um, but I don't, I don't, I, and I agree with Steve, I, I don't see, I haven't seen as much, but I've seen a lot of households and I've heard similar stories of people downsizing to shed uh, mortgage debt because of high rates. And John, the, the numbers around assignment sales, like we're seeing some anecdotal evidence. I even get emailed as editor at Ms. Smartly, you know, that there are, you know, people offering deals on assignments. Again, assignments are people who bought pre-con. It's mm -hmm. now coming up to closing. Um, in, in Toronto, they've either bought condos or in a lot of cases in the GTA, the Toronto area, it's freehold townhouses and homes and uh, or condo towns. And now they have to actually take out a mortgage to close on, on the property. And mm -hmm. some people are in difficulty. It's so hard to assess what part of the market that represents and what that might mean in terms yeah. of overall sales. Um, is your feeling still that it's a small part? of the overall it's market still part of the overall market, you know, and, and again, it doesn't impact. It's kind of funny because it doesn't impact resale prices because all that kind of happens off of sort of anyone's radar. Like you don't know oh, that okay. the default happened. You don't know what the kind of vulture buyer who came in and snapped it up at a discount paid for it. Right. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, and because again, for for every you know, 
for every 10 of those distressed buyers, there are like vulture investors who will want to snap them up. They'll just want to snap them up at a serious discount, right? Mm. So it's right. not it's not like in the US where these dynamics happened and those properties defaulted and those units stayed empty because they overbuilt, which is what happened in the sort of the US financial price, US bubble. Uh, we don't have a risk of overbuilding. So there's going to be someone who's going to take it. It's just not a matter of you know, what price. All right. So let's, uh, you guys have been touching on debt. Let's stay on that right. theme. Um, while we took a big break here at Moose Smartly, some people kept working. One of them is, would be prime minister of Canada, wants to be. Uh, Pierre Polyev released a new video. We talked about his previous video on housing. Uh, and this time it was on debt, debt levels in Canada. So he um, shared some stats. He's uh, let me just pull this up so everyone can see it. Uh, just highlighting here that Canada's combined government, corporate, and household debt uh, is extremely high. You can see the figures there, dwarfing uh, Canada's entire economy. I believe it's a 15-minute uh, video. He calls it a documentary. Um, now, I guess my uh, I want to throw it to Steve. Steve, your uh, your show, The Looney Hour, was a little bit more uh, industrious than we were, and you talked about this video and your take on it right after you released it at the end of December. So wondering uh, what your thoughts were overall and and whether this is indeed something that we should really be thinking about. Uh, I mean, I've personally flagged it, you know, years ago. I think, like, I think ultimately what matters the most is the level of... Um, private debt, particularly as it pertains to like household debt, right? Like households, when they get over levered, um, you know, and rates go up, like they don't have the ability, they don't have the ability of the, the liquidity of the bond market to start, you know, issuing debt and papering over their problems. Right. And that's what we saw, like, obviously the U S the financial crisis, if you look at like household debt to GDP, it started to basically shrink and roll over. It's because obviously all these houses started going into foreclosure and, and, and there was just sort of cleansing of the system so to speak and in canada the household debt during the financial crisis just continued to go up and to the right and now it's at these critical levels so i do think like people have just largely ignored canada's sort of debt issues or problem i think just because like there has yet to be a crisis but just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean that we should be ignoring you know the possibility of one happening and again the only problem is is like you can talk about it but like it could be good for another two years, five years, 10 years, 12 years. Like you just, it is, it is an event that does not happen very frequently. Yes. Um, John, I wonder what you thought. I thought it was a bit um, easy to say, quote, this documentary does not predict if or when a Canadian debt crisis will occur. It simply sets out the facts. I say that only because when we, since the time we launched uh, Move Smartly, we've been hearing about a housing crash and it becomes a bit convenient to say, well, I don't have to tell you when. <laughs> you know, but I, I wonder if you think there is some underlying uh, substance to concerns about debt levels. Um, and again, Pierre uh, combines government, corporate and household. And to my mind, those are very different things. So is that actually helpful to look at it all together like that? Well, yeah, no. I mean, I think the bigger concern like Steve had is, is household, I'd say. Um, but you know, I thought it was interesting because I don't like from a communications perspective, you know, I think the first housing hell video was kind of interesting. It was kind of new. You know, this one I feel is a very, I think it's an odd take because it's a very pessimistic tone. Like the, the whole thing starts off with, what if you knew that there was a bomb under your home? <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, holy crap. And he, and he paints this picture that like, you know, and even though he qualifies by saying I can't predict it, he's painting this picture that we're on this path to this disaster where people are lighting themselves on fire because of distress and suicides being, you know, happening. And I think it's probably overly dramatized. You know what I mean? Like his part of his argument is, well, rates are at 4% now. What if they go to 8%, which is what they were, you know, over 60, you know, over the past 60 years. I think it's a challenging, I don't know. I, I, I Obviously, high debt is not good. I mean, we know that, right? The question is, are we at a point where there is even like a high probability? Because if you're a politician, I mean, this is what they should be concerned about, not like low probability events, right? It's, you know, high-ish probability events. And I'm not sure if we're there. You know, I think, uh, who was it? Trevor Tome from University mm -hmm. of Calgary. He put out a good article in the Hub 
that looked at, which I think is a, a, a very important metric. It's, you know, the, the debt is one thing, but, you know, looking at uh, debt relative to assets is also very important, right? Um, and if you actually look at that, whether you're looking at total assets, which includes real estate or just financial assets, the debt to asset ratio has actually been declining since 2010, right? Uh, so the amount of debt we have relative to the assets we own, at least at, at an aggregate level, um, has been declining. I mean, does, does that mean that there are not over leveraged people who are going to have problems if, um, you know, if things don't go well? Of course not. There are always those people. Right. But the, the question is, you know, are we in this crisis? Right. Where consumers have taken on too much debt? I don't know if we are. But even if we are, the question, I think people have to ask themselves is what's peer solution for personal household debt levels being so high. The solution is only if he wants to operate a nanny state where the state intervenes and says, no, you cannot take out a HELOC to buy an investment property because I think you're over leveraged, right? Like, so the only way you can contain that is if governments intervene and re like kind of pull back on credit by intervening with sort of the banks and saying, we're not going to allow you to take on this much debt relative to your assets, in particular housing. And I think that's unlikely to happen under his government, right? So I'd be curious to see, I think to be following these up with future videos, what his solution is for rising household debt levels. I don't know, other than pulling back on credit, because the government thinks we don't know how to make our own decisions, which is kind of what he's implying. Uh, I don't know what else he's going to come up with. I mean, and I don't know if Steve has any other ideas. Maybe. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know if there's a solution, really. I mean, I think, you know, I think maybe the angle would be. OK, if we had not goosed housing so much and maybe we had more adequate supply, you know, house prices wouldn't have gone up so much. We wouldn't have had these reckless policies that would have allowed people to gorge on all this debt and boost up house prices. I, I you know, I, it's a, such a complicated problem. I mean, like I said, I personally think that, um, I think it is a, I think it is a real problem, but, um, again, it, it, you know, we've been worrying about it for, for several decades now. Right. So, it's it is kind of just like you know how do you how do you get rid of a debt problem? I mean, ultimately you have to delever at some point. One hundred percent. And and that de actually deleverages are incredibly painful. No government wants to go through a deleveraging while they're in power, right? So, but it happened in Canada. It happened. We did with have the, with the federal government. Federal government. Yeah, Canada federal almost government. defaulted. Yes. Yeah. Not out of our lifetimes. And I do wonder why we have such a short memory of this as a society. 1990s, Canada had a fiscal debt crisis. We de did deleverage uh, the Chrétien, Paul Martin. They had to do it. The downloading that occurred, the cutting of, of services and things that happened, the downloading to provinces and municipalities, we still sure. see today that are being complained about. So the, the interesting part, what I find interesting about this, we're under a time bomb. It's ticking and we don't know when it's going to get off. I'm not sure. There are mines in Ottawa that live through a fiscal debt crisis. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I quite buy that a bomb, you know, almost went off and people didn't know or we have no knowledge about that. Um, yeah. at, sorry, John, at the policymaking level. I find that argument a bit suspect. Yeah, and I, I listen. I agree with you. And the the thing is, you know, federal debt levels are, are not at the same level they were at in the '90s. That is the biggest concern. Like one of the bigger concerns, like Steve said, is household debts. They're mm -hmm. kind of tend to be a little bit more vulnerable. And how do you curb that, right? And and there is no magic bullet. You know, like Steve said, no government wants to be under under a government where people are deleveraging. Whether it's a painful deleveraging. Where, you know, like in the US where asset prices fell, home prices fell, the, the market collapsed, or even if you're in a sort of managed deleveraging where the state is restricting credit, because by doing that, they're also restricting growth, right? Like if they're restricting how much people can borrow against their homes to go invest in more real estate, they're restricting growth. And I'm not going to say that's good or bad. Maybe, it, maybe it's a good thing. Maybe we are in debt. Maybe they should be doing that. I just am not convinced Pierre Polyev 
is going to do that. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, and I mean, John, do you think he is part of the problem that if he was in charge of, let's say, the financial institutions that were allowing this mortgage underwriting for people to really extend their amortization, right? Mm -hmm. Which we just saw in the last few years yeah. to manage this high interest rate environment. I mean, is that the kind of thing that the government shouldn't have done? Well, no, I mean, that's a bit different. I think that was done to mitigate default risk, right? Which is completely different type of intervention. I mean, you know, people will argue whether that's good or not, or, you know, but the point is they did that to, to in theory, help households to mitigate sort of the risk of default. Um, we're talking about like new, you know, new debt growth going forward. So anyhow, I don't know what's going to happen, but we'll we'll see what his future videos say. I'm going to be I'm going to be curious to see what his solutions are. Right. Um, OK, I I think that leads us nicely to our next topic, which is also a case of, you know, politicians on all sides of the spectrum using stats very freely. Uh, so earlier in December, there was this exciting graphic from The Economist, which showed that we were, at least in Toronto, along with Calgary and Montreal, living in one of the least expensive cities in North America. Nothing like on the left-hand side here, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Houston. Wow, what an amazing thing to learn. Uh, Elizabeth May of the Green Party uh, quickly stepped onto Twitter Memo to Pierre Polyev, you need to redo your housing hell video in light of this Economist magazine finding that the most livable and cheapest cities in North America are in Canada. Facts matter. Of course, Trevor Toome, who we've just talked about, a University of Calgary economist, quickly pointed out that that index that the Economist reports on does not include any home price costs, mortgage payments, or even rent. So here's a reverse case of broken stats telephone, where I think Polyev's points about housing uh, affordability were well on point. Mm -hmm. And Elizabeth was quick to kind of say there's no uh, housing affordability problem here at all, which seems really tone deaf. Steve, what's your take on this whole thing? I just think that you can manipulate stats and data to kind of show it whatever you want it to show, right? I mean, um, data is just prone to manipulation and, and obviously people can mani manipulate it to show or enhance their own political views or biases, right? So, you know, whether that's on Pierre's side or on Jagmeet or Trudeau or even Elizabeth May's side, everybody has their own, their own angle. And, you know, I think we see a lot of these economists come out too, like even the economists here in Canada that, uh, you know, lean a certain political direction and, and have different takes on the data that comes through. And so, I don't know, just, I think it just, what I would say is for everyone to keep an open mind um, and just ask questions, ask questions, ask, ask questions, think for yourself um, because, you know, some things don't pass a smell test such as Vancouver and Toronto being, uh, you know, affordable cities. So maybe like what, 24 hours before you twext your tweet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that was a tough look. That was, uh, wow, Elizabeth. Uh, John, uh, why would The Economist have a cost of living index that does not include housing? Yeah, I like, mean, it's- what's the, it, what's the point? It's um, it's insane to think that they, I mean, housing is the single biggest expense, right? Um, and to Steve's point, I mean, I think he raises a good one. I mean, I think many of us look at data and we think data is objective. And that is like 100% incorrect. Oh yeah, put it in a chart and it's real. I mean, I, I like you can you can I don't know, like manipulate or like use data in a certain way to tell a story that fits mm -hmm. your narrative, right? Um, you know, and obviously the best people try to avoid that and try to be unbiased, but a hundred percent, like if I wanted to spin data a certain way, there's definitely stats I could use that would tell a story. I mean, it wouldn't be, it'd be kind of statistically correct but the narrative and the impression would not necessarily be true and i think we do have to be cautious of that um why do they not include it i mean i think again i, I think i saw trevor tweet that um it, it has to do with challenges with comparing the cost of living across countries and part of that has to do with how a lot of countries measure housing in their cpi 
um, and they use different methodologies. I mean, Canada uses what's called a user cost model where they use the cost of housing and, and what the interest and all those payments are, which is why the, the CPI on housing costs actually fell when home prices were rising because the interest component was falling, right? Um, US uses a rental equivalent. So everyone does something slightly different. So it's hard to get, you know, a, an index that is comparable. But anyhow, I think it's- uh, well, I, I have a question for you. Yeah, I'm like put you on the spot. If you were to say, like, and you have to like use like a kind of like somewhat of like a broad stroke, mm -hmm. but like if you were to say like inner city, sort of more core prime real estate in like Toronto. So yeah. I'm not talking about like the suburbs. I'm talking about like in the core mm -hmm. of Toronto. How much would you say prices are down since the peak? Like just as a broad stroke, um, general view. Oh, I'd say we're probably still down. I think it's probably close to... So Tor Toronto Core didn't fall as much as the suburbs. So I'm trying to... Right. So at an aggregate, I think as an aggregate, we're down about 20 from the peak, rough, roughly like low rise prices. Um, I just off the top of my head. I what think condos? condos was last because condos also didn't go up as much. Right. So if low and low rise got to hit the most, because that's where we saw the biggest acceleration. Right. So if low rise at an aggregate is close to 20 down from the peak, because even though we went up last year, we kind of lost all of that. Um, suburbs dip more than 20. And I think downtown dip less than 20. So maybe we're like down 15% in, in downtown Toronto, something like that. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. You don't want you guys to bring that up. So I'd say Vancouver is like literally like, I'd say we're half that. I'd say inner city in the city of Vancouver. I'm not talking about some like suburb that's 40 minutes out or 35 mm -hmm. minutes out. We're down like five to 10, eight, eight to 10%. Yeah, I mean, we could be 10. I mean, I'm going off the top of my head. I don't know for sure for Toronto, but it, it's it got to be kind of in that 10 to 15, probably. It's not 20. Okay, okay. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I just had, well, it's funny because you were just brought up like, you know, um, people like handpicking certain data points. I well, talked about this on the, on our Looney Hour podcast there, but I was like, just, I just, my my comment was basically like, that it's been surprising how resilient most major metros in Canada have been given where rates are. I would have suspected a larger decline. Like if you'd asked me three years ago, if mortgage rates went from 1.5 to 5.5, mm. where would housing be? And, and what I'm seeing in, in general rule of thumb is that like major metros are down, let's say five to 10%. Mm -hmm from the peak on oh, no, including like Montreal, you know, obviously Calgary's up, uh, Ottawa, mm -hmm. Vancouver, Toronto, et cetera. And uh, anyways, this guy was like, oh, you know, he emailed me like a week later and was like, you're deceiving the public. That's so incorrect. And he's like, he pointed to like the average sales price across the nation, which is like, you know, he took Korea's average sale price from the peak to down and it was like down like 21 percent mm -hmm. but i was like well you know you know average sales price doesn't account for composition yeah for sure and it's a volatile metric and i said if you actually look at most major metropolitan cities of the inner core you know of course these suburbs some of these suburbs to your point have been you know vancouver suburbs like vancouver suburbs from the peak i'd say some of them are probably down about 20 percent mm -hmm. Let's see. What's interesting is that dynamic that you're describing. It's actually exactly what happened, uh, I believe, like in the cities that I researched during the U.S. housing bubble. Uh, it was the cities, like it was the inner core, like the urban areas that held up a lot better uh, than some of the suburban markets for whatever reason. Um, yeah. So it's interesting. We're kind of seeing that now, and I think, but this is, I think, a function of like. You know, there is some, I mean, there are amenities downtown and you're closer to work. Like there's a reason why maybe some of these markets were more stable, um, you know, precisely because, you know, they're, they're close to downtown and you don't have to have a, you know, one hour commute if you work at the office, for example. Yeah. Yeah. I would argue that the inner city stuff yeah. didn't go up as much either during the pandemic. But that was just because 
people rushed into the suburbs. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, that was, I think, a, just a behavior. Going back to what you said at the beginning, where like these animal spirits and the, this herd mentality, that was like a pure herd mentality that I'm not just going to the suburbs. I'm buying like 10 acres in the middle of nowhere and like yeah. being away from everybody because COVID's never going away, right? Well, yeah. I mean, nobody wanted to be in an elevator, right? I mean, exactly. uh, um, getting locked down in, in, a, in a high-rise condo Oh yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't blame people. And then obviously that's why we saw during the pandemic, right? I mean, not only did downtown Vancouver prices not go up, like the suburbs did, they actually declined. Yeah. yeah um, sure. And really still haven't really recovered. Um, yeah. Is so. it fair to say also, because um, John, you wrote in 2017 when there was a bubble in York region, which is a suburb area North of Toronto, mm -hmm. uh, investors really moved heavily into freehold detached homes there. Mm -hmm. Because they are cheaper to start with um, than a lot of the houses downtown, right? So if you're an investor, it, yeah. you're attracted to a lot of these marginal areas. Uh, COVID as well, you saw people really spreading far out into the GTA, even stretching the bounds of its definition. Mm -hmm. So that cottage country saw itself ramped up. Mm -hmm. um, now, if that is secondary home buying third, you know, does what not that money the first to recede? Mm -hmm. when you have to deleverage when yeah, interest sure. rates go up. Yeah. So, you know, I wonder if there's always this protective mechanism around that when it comes yeah. to the investor marginal activity mm -hmm. being one of those reasons that you see. And I think you wrote about that, that some of the highest run-ups and drops are caused by that kind of marginal activity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the Bank of Canada used our data for that when the, in their financial system review in 2008, that it was like the, the areas that saw this biggest run up in investor demand saw the biggest crash in prices. Because they're so, the ones that can have yeah. to get out or deleverage, De whereas an average family will probably do anything they can. Yeah. And they went up on. higher and they, and they outbid. They, 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 you know, the higher you rise, the, you know, the harder you're going to fall usually, right, in real estate. So, and that's what they experienced. But uh, Steve, I'm going to share your, um, I, I have the same grievance that you have. It's going to be one of our themes or my theme. 2024, Canada is not one real estate market. The reporting of these average prices, uh, even the provincial story is so different. And I really think it's getting to the point where it is hurting the ability of policymakers to do things that are effective. Um, and, you know, I think that's something that, you know, you pushed that right. That person that wrote into you is kind of just took Polya's video of we have the biggest landmass in the world. <laughs> we have everywhere to build. Yeah, <laughs> like, well, I no, think, like, you can't do that. <laughs> you know, I have chats with people like voluntarily, like a lot of the times all across Canada. You know, they just well, they'll reach out and then just ask for I think they just want someone to talk to about housing that they feel is you know, on top of things. And, and so, you know, I had a conversation with a guy this week and he's like, you know, I'm a first time buyer. I've got this cash. I've got this good income, but I'm really worried about, you know, the mark I'm he's buying in Halifax. Uh, maybe it was a suburb in Halifax. And he's like, you know, I've got a phase that like, I want to buy a house for 500 grand. I was mm -hmm. like, you know, but I'm really worried about prices, you know, crashing. And I was like, I don't know. I'm not so worried about like, you know, a house in Halifax for 500 K crashing. I mean, what does that go down to like four fifty? like, whereas mm -hmm. like the GTA, right? I mean, a two and a half million dollar house going down to 1.9 million or 1.8 million. I mean, that's, you know, that's a lot of money, 700,000 yeah. bucks. So yeah. these markets are not the same. I mean, I think it's just important that uh, as we're seeing now, I mean, John, I, definitely feels to me like the gta is the hardest hit i would probably argue that vancouver has got to be number two yeah and our, our and even, not even the gta i'd say like southern ontario um because it's these outskirts you know the further out you moved it's like those those areas even outside of the gta saw an even bigger run up than the gta uh so yeah those areas are probably you know being hit a little bit harder than even the gta yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it was an incredible run up like into like the, the bounds of what you would consider the greater Toronto area were severely, severely pushed. Mm -hmm. um, so I know we're running a bit over, but do we do a bit of a bumper issue and do our last our last topic? 
we're sure. over yeah, our we usual power, time. We can power through it. Sure. All right. Okay. So uh, I thought, Steve, you really brought up another great and important topic. I think that's um, going to be important uh, not only now, but for a very long time to come, which is this whole idea of um, there seems to be a lot of activity now on the supply side part of the housing crisis in Canada. So we saw a really uh, remarkable movement on many municipal and provincial governments in 2022 to change zoning, to allow a lot more density, to in some cases have provinces override municipal rules on where areas could be built up. So we've seen a lot of changes in Toronto, in Vancouver, um, uh, Steve, that's even being undertaken at the municipal level. So that density is being included. Uh, or in some cases forced, in some cases um, freed up, depends on what side of the argument you're on. And uh, this led to a really interesting exchange uh, between Mike Moffat, who's been a guest on our show, uh, in response to Steve, your comment that uh, as of right now, the big question is how municipal governments will fight back, trying to find ways around this, meaning some of these uh, zoning changes. In my discussions with the local building industry, things are largely on hold until we get more direction from each city. So for example, less than four months ago, the city of Vancouver approved their own multiplex zoning, allowing for 1.0 uh, FRS on the standard size lots. FSR, so four space. FSR, rate. sorry, yes, sorry. And you're gonna unpack that for us. However, the BC legislation is now pushing for 1.5. So that's a huge difference. And if I'm a developer contemplating a multiplex development, I don't see how you can pr proceed until this is being clarified. So your your point is that this uh, activity, which is meant to like spur construction and spur supply of housing, is actually introducing uncertainty. Yeah, I think in the near term, right? So I'll just give you the guys like for the listeners the quick numbers. So the average lot size in the city of Vancouver is 4,000 square feet. Uh, so the Vancouver city went through these large and long deliberations about approving multiplex housing, right? So duplex, triplex, fourplex on these 4,000 square foot lots. So they eventually passed the motion in September. So you can now in most of the parcels that are zoned single family, as long as your lots, like I think it's a minimum of like 39 or 3,800 square feet, um, you can build um, 1.0 floor space ratio. So basically if your lot size is 4,000 square feet, you can build 4,000 square feet of living interior space. Um, now the BC government has basically said, well, we're basically going to override all municipal zoning. We want multiplex to be allowed on any single family lot in anywhere in BC with a population greater than 5,000 people. So what happens, the city of Vancouver just spent all this time and money and deliberations about approving 1.0 floor space ratio. And the BC government is saying, well, no, our guidelines are indicating we are highly recommending and strongly suggesting 1.5 FSR. And so as a developer, at 1.0, you can build 4,000 square feet. At 1.5, you can build 6,000 square feet. Well, I mean, that's an extra 2,000 square feet <laughs> is not insignificant. I mean, that's at least another unit or two. Um, and so again, as a developer that's going to deploy three, four, $5 million into one of these sites, um, I don't see how you can proceed until you have some strong clarity about your unit mix and how you, how much you can build. Now, Steve, to push back a little bit, um, development is a super risky game. Uh, I'll you know I definitely definitely appreciate that how much is there about this sometimes feeling that developers are always pointing to one thing or another kind of um either having them hold off decision making or you know adding uncertainty I say that because governments change every four years in Ontario we had the Ford government come in and it came in gung-ho saying development fees would be removed things could be developed we're going to go into the green belt well, actually, they said they wouldn't, but maybe somebody knew because they attended a certain wedding that maybe that would change. Doesn't that uncertainty go both ways? Isn't there always something that developers are saying, you know, I don't know if I can build yet? It, it seems like that's a common refrain from the development community. Yeah, I think so. I think, um, you know, I think that there's definitely uncertainty. And I, I think what I will say is like most 
the developers, builders we chat with are obviously excited about the multiplex. It, it, it is going to have strong uptake. It is a important step in the right direction uh, for that, you know, supply and the, and the building community. Um, I think it's just hard to, to proceed when you're, you know, there's so much money on the line. And so there's just a lot of, you know, there's still, there'll be still be some projects coming through the pipeline, but I think people just want to have a little bit more certainty. They can sit down once the guidelines are very, very clear. They can sit down with their architect and really start planning these new designs. Um, because, you know, multiplexes are a brand new concept in Vancouver and in the lower, in most of all the lower mainland. So, um, like I said, I do a bunch of stuff in Calgary and the multiplex stuff has been quite popular there for the last, I think, five plus years now in terms of uptake, but everybody knows, you know, how to build them and, and what to do. Um, but it's such a new process here in Vancouver. We'll, we'll see how things sort of unfold. I had, uh, I had a similar issue come up recently where I met with someone who's selling a lot kind of close to transit, you know, and obviously they're asking, well, what can I get for it? Right. And, you know, we're in this transition where, um, you know, again, how are people valuing properties is a, might even be a function of like what they expect to be coming down the pipeline. Right. And if they think, the province is going to be opening things up or the city's opening things up and allowing more, more density. Well, you're not in a rush to sell now, right? Because, you know, and, and to Steve's point, that property, like if you are owner of a single family home lot, I mean, and this is sort of the challenge. If the developer has it already, you know, they're, they're getting this bonus basically, right? Whereas tomorrow, if the province upzones to, to one and a half, well, that's going to be reflected in the land value, or at least part of it will be, because that is going to push land values up if you can up. I mean, I don't know if you disagree, but I think to some extent, if you can build more housing, uh, it's not going to be dollar for dollar, but land values are definitely going to be going up. And I'm not, I've seen that with, with sellers who are con considering holding off to see if they can get more money because of that. Oh, yes. Yeah, so if you look at, um, I think because they did the blanket mass rezonings, they also did the next to transit oriented density, they call it TOD. Um, so it's basically like if you have a single family house that's within 800 meters of a SkyTrain or like active bus station, mm -hmm. um, then you can build up to, I mean, depends on the proximity, but they are saying you can go up to like 20 stories in some cases, they want to mandate that, right? So like now if you're a single family homeowner that's 400 meters from a SkyTrain station, I, I don't think I'd be selling today. I would want to see once this legislation's fully through and it's with all the municipalities how this land sort of gets priced and 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 so it does it, and so if you're like think about this if you're a developer and you own a site that's within 200 meters of a sky train station and the city after three years of rezoning it uh you they have finally approved you to build a six-story condo building all of a sudden the bc government saying no no we want minimum 20 stories if it's within 200 meters. So as the developer, you're like, well, I was just about to put the shovel in the ground, but you're, hold on, you're telling me I can go from six now, the government, this government's telling me I can do 20. So like, I don't see as a developer there that, that how you can proceed. Mm -hmm. um, I think you have to basically wait for this to sort of shake out and then resubmit a new application and and start from scratch because yeah. you know, this isn't, this isn't, you know, we're not talking hundreds of thousands of dollars here. We're talking hundreds of millions on these type of projects. Yes. I mean, my final thought, and maybe this is pushing it, but, you know, in response to Mike, uh, Mike's comment that, you know, these policies only work if you're really clear and promise they'll be in place and not changed for a set amount of time. First of all, four years is the time period of every government. So beyond that, we've seen even with the green belt in Canada and in Ontario, I don't know what you can promise. But secondly, secondly, I do wonder, isn't this a little bit uh, like the seller's fallacy? Like, if these developers are in a position now to make money on on properties that basically made no financial sense at all, now we're talking 1.0 and 1.5. And I get it. It's a big difference. But we're talking about differences on the gains. Mm -hmm. And this fear that you develop a project, the company, your rival company builds something else in two years, they make more. I mean, isn't there a little bit of this going on now that these properties overnight have been made such a much more viable and I would assume valuable overnight. 
I well, I don't know. That's where I'm. It's it's tough because if you think again of the city of Vancouver, it's a four thousand square foot lot, and if the if the government is saying you can build six thousand square feet on that, I I don't I, how how do you jam six thousand square feet on a four thousand square? Foot? I was actually wondering. I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> like, unless they have like, you know, allow like you know, more than three, like, I don't know, you gotta be like four. No, they're saying, they're saying three stories, right? Oh, so that's what I'm on. saying. It's as an architect, I'm not an architect, but you'd have to really sit down with an architect and you'd have to really think that through because I'm not convinced you're going to be able to sufficiently jam just because you can build 6,000 mm -hmm. square feet. I don't think that you necessarily okay. should. Build yeah. 6,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And because, I mean, that's the thing and you're right. Because there are going to be other constraints on, on the project, like, you know, your lot coverage, all of these things. Yeah. Are... So you're going to push that 6,000 square feet, like right to the lot line. And then like, you can't. yeah, you can't. I, 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 that's what I'm saying. It's just like, there's too many, like, I, there's too many variables right now where it's like, at least for me, I'm, you know, I know there's some people that are, I'm sure are smarter that, you know, architects, builders that do this every single day have found ways and we'll find ways quicker than than i can but as of right now i think there's still a lot of like question marks about like okay how do you design this yeah, yeah. interesting that's fair enough. yeah for sure all right well that seems still a little hopeful <laughs> right there might be some new micro lot dwellings that we can all cram all ourselves housing. into yeah. <laughs> um all right well thank you uh thanks for going on a little bit longer i found that really informative and a great discussion and uh, yeah, we'll do the same thing next month. Same channel. Good. Sounds good. Well, nice All right. Have a good one, guys. <laughs>